Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Sean Henry Scott Singer. I go by the position of an apostle in the body of Jesus Christ. Today is 5-30-2017. And we're right smack dab in the middle of the observance of Shavuot, or some may know as the Feast of Pentecost. Um, we're done with the count of the Omer, and now we're right smack in the middle of the time where it is that we observe when God gave the children of Israel the law, the Ten Commandments. We're right in the middle of that. And today we'll be speaking on a subject entitled, What You Waiting For? What you Waiting For? Or What Are You Waiting For? I believe in my heart, mind, body, and soul that there are times when we don't allow the Word to do what it is supposed to do. And as a result, we find ourselves waiting on things that God has already provided for us. But that is why we preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that people receive the faith. Because the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we'll be preaching and teaching on a subject entitled, What You're Waiting For. And as we always do, we begin with the word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you for allowing us to be here and alive right now in the name of Jesus. It's only by your grace and your mercy that we're here, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We thank and praise you for this opportunity and platform to share and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have given us Ustream.tv to be live, YouTube for playback, and also Facebook Live, Father God. I pray in the name of Jesus by the power and authority that was given to us by way of the Holy Spirit, Father God, that you go out and simply arrest those, Father God, in the name of Jesus that may be straying away that you touch them from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet, Father God, that the anointing would destroy every yoke, Father God, every yoke of bondage. That was the whole purpose of you, Father God, sending in a deliverer, Moses, Father God, to free your people from Egyptian bondage because they could not serve you in bondage. The Bible is written and it says that we should worship you in spirit and in truth, Father God. I just pray in the name of Jesus as we spend this time together that you uh, take over in the name of Jesus, allow your spirit to Teach, lead, direct, and guide in the name of Jesus Christ. A lot of words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Father God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Hallelujah and amen. Today we'll be speaking on a subject on our Midweek Miracle Sermon, What You Waiting For? And if you ever need to get in contact with our ministry, feel free to call us at 614-847-2057 or 614-723-9770. And we'll do our very best to get it back in contact with you. Also, you can reach us at by way of the internet at www.teamjesususa.com. That's our ministry website there. And we'll be coming first out of the one of the books of the, in Torah uh, of the Torah in Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, a very familiar passage of scripture. But it's a script. It's just some word that people don't seem to understand at times because. I hear people all the time say the law has been abolished or the law has been fulfilled so there's no need for us to understand and know the law. And I would beg to differ because without the law, there will be lawlessness. Um, the Bible lets us know in the New Testament that the law was the schoolmaster. And we all know who went to secular schooling that if we did not learn how to read, we would not know how to read. And if we didn't know basic mathematics, we wouldn't know how to count. So there, there, there is a purpose and a reason for the law. I don't want to get too deep because I got a lot of people that watch and follow me don't even go near a church. So I want to keep it very basic. So we in 2017 have the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. Excuse me, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which is known as the Torah. And there are five of them. And we also have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because the day of Pentecost has fully come. We're living in a time in the name of Jesus Christ where some don't understand that the Torah, the Old Testament, how you doing, Ernest, was the foreshadow of things that Jesus Christ will fulfill when he came. And like I said, we'll be beginning, we'll beginning in Exodus 20, and I want to start reading because there's a lot of scripture here. And the Lord spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he begins speaking to the children of Israel reaffirming them as to who he was, is. He says, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Now, Egypt to us, living in this day and time, represent 
a time and a place where we were in sin. We got to understand when they talk about Egypt in the Bible days, it's not the Egypt that we deal with. The Egypt that we deal with is a form of sin bondage. Those that was of us that lived in sin, who wasn't going to church all their little holy life, Egypt represented, I want you to understand this before we get into it, that Egypt represented a place where they was forced to uh, honor uh, pagan holidays and things that, 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 that they came with, the pharaohs came up with. They, the Egypt represented a place where they were forced to, 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 to bow when, they, when, when, when he came through, when, when they brought Pharaoh through or he was coming past, they was for, forced to give him reverence. Uh, Egypt represented a place where they was forced to build these pagan statues. I don't want, I, I hear the Holy Spirit speaking and I don't want to step on nobody's Holy Ghost toes, but Egypt represented a place where people had to, had to give him homage and they wasn't given a choice. Basically, I see in spiritually, I know I'm going to make some people mad, where Egypt has in a form, in a way, turned into America. A place where when, you have, when you're forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance, because if you don't say the pledge, that means you're not alleging your pledge to this flag. Uh, Egypt represented a place where uh, Pharaoh came up with days that you had to honor him. Okay, I want y'all to honor me on this day and that day and this day. I'm going to make up some days so that you will have to honor me. So Egypt represented those type of things. These are the things that we're not taught and preached on on this day and time. So what the enemy has done is he's crept in unaware and he's tricked us into worshiping uh, antichrist things by uh, masking them in different names and stuff. And what he does now is he uses our emotions. Seeing as how the devil, he can't take your stuff, but he can deceive you into worshiping him. Because the Bible says, and like I said in the prayer, that God desires for us to worship him in spirit and in truth, not in flesh and lies. So, I am the Lord thy God, in, in, in verse 2, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So, God has brought us out, and he brought us out of the house of bondage. We was in bondage where we couldn't say what we wanted to do. We was in a place where we couldn't choose what we wanted to do. People think now because they can vote that they put that, 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 that POTUS in office. You had nothing to do with the agenda of this government because this government don't serve the God that we serve. So we get into it and it says, verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, little G's. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now what is a god? A god can be made out of anything that you place above the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I say place above him, place above his word. Place, place above his uh, agenda. The Bible tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his ways. So we have been called to place God above everything. You hear people say God, uh, uh, family, ministry, and so on and so forth. But that's not the case. Because if you look at their lives, the order of priority in their life is not set that way. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Some people put their job before God. Some people put their spouses before God. Some people put their children before God. Some people put their own selfish agenda before God. Verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So if that's the case, why we got all these statues all over the earth? Why do we have all these things honoring the creation and ignoring the creator? Why do we have all these things that people go stand at, all these monuments of dead people and dead things that we go and give homage to? Well, I want to go see the this and that, and I want to go see the this. What, what, what for? He sat there and says, Thou shalt make unto thee, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. He is teaching us how to stay out of bondage. That's what the law is to me. The law isn't to me a, a thing that will keep me from living the way I want to live. The law keeps me out of bondage. Ever since I denounced pagan holidays, believe me, my wallet is fatter. Because I don't have to celebrate everything man says that comes up with. Okay, today we're going to have this this day. Today is Sister's Day. Today is Brother's Day. Today is Cat's Day. Today is called Dog's Day. Today is pa Pastor's First Wife Day. Today is Pastor's Day. None of these things are in the Bible because those were in Egypt. He delivered us from those things. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So what has happened is 
Instead of us teach, teaching our children godliness, our kids go to, our children go to school and we're, I pledge allegiance to the flag. What do you pledge allegiance to a flag for? Some old uh, lady back in the day, some the porch and made some, 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 some out of some material and somebody liked it and all of a sudden they decide, okay, we're going to lift that up and make everybody pledge allegiance to it. And when they don't, we're going to ostracize them. Look at Colin Kaepernick. NFL teams, yeah, they liked him when he was just throwing the football and keeping his mouth shut. But as soon as he says, look here, the way y'all treat uh, Afro-Americans in this country is not right. And until y'all do it right, I am not going to stand in allegiance to some flag that's supposed to protect the poor and the weak and the needy. So because he decided to take a stand for what is right, all of a sudden now he's ostracized. Well, guess what? We're just going to blackball him. We're not going to let him make money. So what happened to the pursuit of happiness? So long, I could be happy, or I could pursue happiness as long as it doesn't get in the way of your gods. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous of God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying, Christians are the ones that are supposed to be making them stand, but Christians are the very ones putting their hand over their heart, repeating these pledges and vows. That flag ain't your God. No one who... Who, who died in the army or, or served or, or that, that, ain't, that ain't none of your God. That ain't who saved you. That ain't the one who allowed nine inch nails to go through their hands and be saved for you. But why is it that Christians are the ones, the very ones that are standing up, putting their hand over their heart, down and pledging allegiance to a flag that somebody made somewhere? That's the creation. That's not the creator. Verse six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So the mercy is to the thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. Verse 7 in, in chapter 20. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord God, excuse me, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that take of his name in vain. What is he doing? He's teaching us how to stay out of bondage. Because we was taught to live in bondage. From a child up. The Bible says we're supposed to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's what the word says. But instead of that, we teach our children the ways of the world because of fear of lack. If we don't do what they tell us to do, we can't have the things they said we can have. Well, I'll tell you what, as a believer, I don't want what they're trying to give me. I want what God is trying to give me. Number eight, and this is something that has caused great debate for whatever reason, but I'm going to explain it to you once I re after I read it. Number eight, uh, verse eight in chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is what God showed it would be before we fasted and prayed and I started the ministry in 2000. I had never in my life had church on Saturday or the Sabbath. Never. Never had. But after praying and fasting before I started my ministry, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to be on the original Sabbath. And I did not understand it at all. I did not understand it. But I, but I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I didn't want to continue on what was being done because what was being done was not freeing people. I was still, still seeing people going up for prayer being bound. I was still seeing people, I'm not throwing shade on no church, but I was still seeing people going in and coming out the same way. I was still seeing people being stuck on stupid, broke, busted, and disgusted. So I said, God, what is it that we need to do as your people to get back to, to the way that you, you, get back to the things that you've given us as a people, as our God? And he says, I want you I want you to have your services. I want you to have church. I want you to assemble. I want you to fellowship on the original Sabbath. I don't want you to do what they're doing. And it caused all kinds of heyday, obviously, in the beginning, because there was a time where if people did have church on service it, on Saturday, it was an extra day. It wasn't their original. It wasn't the day they assembled. And I prayed and asked God for understanding. I said, Lord, I need to be able to tell people something. He says, I have given you, my people, a rest. I've given my people a rest. And that was all I had to hear because I was the type of person. I went to church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I was that devoted when I was serving that I went every single day. Every single day was a church, some form of a church day because there was something that needed to be going on. Monday, we had brotherhood practice. Tuesday, we had Bible study. Wednesday, we had noon Bible study. And, and that afternoon, we had a choir rehearsal. Thursday, we had praise team practice. Friday, we had joy night service. Saturday, they had mother's prayer. And Sunday, obviously, we had Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday service, Sunday night service, and I drove the van. So I was going seven days a week. And then I was going to work. I worked third shift and first shift. So I had no rest. And the people were God. I was dying as if I was in Egypt. I was working constantly, constantly. 
And even though a lot of work was involved with the church building work, I was still wearing myself out and I didn't have a rest. And God said, he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God is not trying to impose rules on us and stipulations so we can't enjoy this life. The Bible makes it clear he's given us everything to enjoy. But what it is is when you don't enjoy things and do things the way God has given them to you, you're putting yourself back in that Egyptian bondage. And that was the truth for the matter. So God shared with me, and I, I shared with one um, lady, I was ministering to an old lady way back, probably almost 20 years ago, and I asked her one time, she said, why are you on Saturday? And I asked her, I said, man, with all due respect, when do you rest? And she couldn't answer me. She could not answer me because we have this mentality that if I don't do it, it won't be done. Who is your God? That would define who your God is if you think that if you don't do it, it won't be done. God is, uh, he's our Lord, he's our King, he's our Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shammah, he's ever present. If we don't let God be God, we will feel that way. And that's the Egyptian mentality. Verse 10, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy son, nor thy daughters, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor, thy str nor the stranger that is within thy gates. This is not something that he took lightly. Nobody was to work. The land was supposed to Sabbath. For in six days, verse 11, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that there is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He hallowed it. That's a day that he gave us to rest and to be in his rest. The land was supposed to rest. Your servants were supposed to rest. Your daughters, your manservant, the cattle. That was a day that that, that, that favor wasn't going to give you because he wanted his, his idols built. He wasn't going to give you no rest. And y'all know that. Caesar. Oh, I've been mandated. I got to go to work on Sunday. I can't go to church. <laughs> my, my brother Keith, who's, who's watching right now, told me that his job done changed some rules where even though he done got seniority from working there for so long, they done switched some things around now where he got to work on Sunday. He can't even go to church sometimes. See, that, that's the way Caesar is. They don't care about your God. They don't care about you going to church. They don't care about you having a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't want you there because they know if you get free, like the original thing God told Moses to do, you go in there and you tell Moses to let my people go three days into the wilderness so they can serve me. They don't want you to do that because they know if you, you worship God in spirit and truth, you'll come to the understanding by where the Holy Spirit that you don't need them. Hallelujah. Verse 12 in chapter 20 of Exodus, Honor thy father and thy mother in the days shall be long upon the land which the Lord giveth thee. Now, this is a promise. These are promises. He says, honor thy mother and thy father, and thy days shall be long upon the earth. That's a promise. I know for a fact that people who treat their mother and their father like bad, they shorten their days. These are things that God has given us. Uh, 13, thou shalt not kill. And people talk about this stuff has been abolished. So, uh, this still against the law to kill people. You can't just run up and kill somebody. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, I know this is speaking Chinese to some people. Thou shalt not commit adultery. What is adultery? Adultery is when you are married to somebody. You took a, a, a vow that, that on, no man shall cover thee but me. You, when you took a vow to only have sex with your wife. This what, people act like adultery is a strange thing. That, that, well, what's that mean? That means you the only person you can be with is the person you married. You did, well, I'm just not going to get married. Well, you're going to hell too because you can't commit fornication. All these single people think, I'm like, well, I'm just going to stay single and get my groove on. No, it don't work that way. That was me back in the day. You can't just stay single and get your groove on. And it ain't like I didn't enjoy it, but I got convicted by the Holy Spirit because I wasn't trying to go to hell for eternity. You can't commit fornication either, but it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 15 in chapter 20 of Exodus, thou shalt not steal. Since when is it legal for you to steal? If these laws have been abolished, and Jesus fulfilled the law, and there, there's no need for these. Since when is it illegal for you to steal? You can't steal. 16, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. 17, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his man, manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is in thy neighbor's. Now, what is God saying with that particular law? There are things that God has for you, and only you. What God has for you is for you. So what happens when folks look over this, oh, they got them a new car, I'm going to get me a new car. 
Oh, he got him a new wife. I'm going to get rid of my wife. going to get me. See, you ain't supposed to be looking at what they got. You're supposed to be looking at what God has for you. We all have different fingerprints. And we all have a different voice print. And God recognizes us by our praise, our prayer, and our worship. He worships you by the work he has given you for your hands. He ain't give you your neighbor's work. Everybody has different things to do. There are many gifts and many operations. But when you covet somebody, oh, I want to play the organ like that. I want to sing like she sang. Or I want to shout like he shout. I want to dress like they dress. God gave you your own stuff. One of the biggest mistakes I made back in 1992, somebody, my brother of mine had let me hear this uh, tape. Uh, it was a cassette tape. And it was a, a cassette tape preaching of a sermon that Bishop T.D. Jakes was preaching. And I said within myself, I didn't even say it out loud. I said within myself, man, boy, if I could learn how to preach like that. Man, the Holy Spirit rebuked me so quick. It was like, that ain't your ministry. That is not who I've called you to be. Because, you know, we hear people saying stuff and doing stuff. That's, the that's what Pharaoh does. That's the way the world teaches. Oh, I want to learn how to dribble like that. I want to shoot like that. I want to run like that. I want to dress like that. I would, I would dare to say that 90% of humanity do things based off of what they see somebody else do versus what God has created them to do. There are so many things that are not being used in operation, even in the body of Jesus Christ, because people are busy coveting what other people do. Are they, they're a published author? Well, I'm going to write a book. Or oh, they, they, they did their hair like that? I want to do their hair like that. Or oh, they wearing snake skin? I want to wear snake skin. Or oh, they wearing them kind of dresses? I, you ain't supposed to covet nothing nobody doing. God made you peculiar. He made you be, and it's really sad that the church copied the world. That's really, you, how you going to copy the blind? Well, how are you going to copy the folks that you're supposed to be leading to God? You're getting your ideas. In. I hear people all the time, and they think they're cute doing this. They be on, on the Facebook thing. They playing a little keyboard. Look, I can play this riff, and I can do this, and I can do that run. And then they say, ooh, look what they're doing. Now I can do it. Now I can do it. Get your own stuff. I got songs that ain't nobody ever heard because the Holy Spirit gave them to me when I was in my closet, and I was worshiping God. And God gave me a song that, the, that, that no one has, has heard. But it's a song of deliverance and a song of praise to the people God has assigned to me to, to, to bring out of bondage. And I believe you are the same way. God has given you things that no one else has heard. But when you're busy doing what everybody else is telling you you should be doing or covered in somebody else's gifts, you can't do what God has called you to do. We're, we're supposed to be a peculiar, a holy nation. Everything he did through the children of Israel who he chose was so they would be his people. Now, how are you going to be his people looking like those people? He freed you from Egypt, but yet still you want to boot it and suit it just like the Egyptians. If you put a pimp right here dressed up and you put a preacher, sometimes by the way they look on the outward, you can't even tell the difference. These cats dress so shiny and, and so worldly, you can't even tell the difference between who is who by the way they're dressing. Because there, Jesus didn't look like nobody when he showed up. He didn't walk like nobody. He didn't talk like nobody. He didn't deliver like nobody else. He delivered like he was him. And that's how we're supposed to be. But instead, we want to look like, oh, what they wearing? What's the newest fad out? Are oh, they wearing those now? Let me go buy me some. You ain't supposed to covet. So we go to verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and noise of the trumpet. And this is what went on. Because we're right in the middle of the observance of Pentecost or Shavuot. Back in the Old Testament, it was Shavuot when God gave the law, the Torah, to the children of Israel when he told them to come to the Mount Sinai. So this is where we're at because it started on sundown yesterday and it's going to go to sundown tomorrow. So that's the observance that we're in. That's why I'm particularly reading this. But the sermon is called What You're Waiting For. And I'm going to get into the, that towards the end. Verse 18, And all the people saw the thunders and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpets and the mountains smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood far off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. See, it was so powerful. They couldn't even contain it. It was so powerful, God speaking from heaven. It was, could, verse 20, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his, that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. He had came to prove them. After every all the miracles he had shown them, before you enter into your promise, there will be a test before the blessing. There will be some things that you will have to go through to, to prove you. God's going to prove you. It ain't like he, he knows who he is. 
I realize and recognize the maturity of growing up as a believer that the things that I experience and go through are not so God could watch me go through them. He was showing me me. I didn't know I had the strength to go, to a, go through a divorce until I had to. I was broken when I went through my first divorce. Yes, first divorce. I was broken because I, I loved that woman with everything that was in me, but there was nothing I can do to force somebody to do what the Bible was saying do. And we all believe sometimes that when we come into the church, everything going to be roses. It didn't even start until I went into the church. To be honest with you, and I hate to say this, but it's the God's given truth that it, when, I was, when I was in sin and living in ignorance to the scripture, it seemed like my life was perfect. You know, I was doing what I wanted to do, all careless and, and free, and I, I didn't have no conscience necessarily about some of the things I was doing, but, but as God, his Holy Spirit started to draw me back in, and I started, I started looking for things as they really were. And especially when I started to have children at the age of 20, I said I did not want to pass none of the things that was wrong with me onto my children. Spiritual things. But at, as I matured in Jesus Christ, I realized the things that I was going through was, number one, the things that I was causing. Because I was born into a saved family. A family who went to church. I was taught at an early age to understand that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I was taught those things by way of the scripture. I didn't understand them because I didn't have no bills to pay. But I, I understood by into my hearing that the Lord was my shepherd, I shall not want. And that David killed Goliath and Jonah was in the way. I was taught these things as a child. But as I, I, I grew up at, in my teenage years, peer pressure and the world, we, was, we were lured away. I was raised up in the age of, of hip hop. And the music at that particular time was kind of innocent, you know. We, you know, house party. It was, it was simple things. And what got me really onto uh, other things and what lured me away was music. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. And had a desire. I grew up around some some great people. Lance Burgess is on here, uh, the Burgess family, and um, I, I was raised around some great people. So I really wasn't uh, didn't, didn't have a peer pressure. Didn't want to drink or smoke or nothing. We just danced and had a little fun. But what I came to understand as I was maturing is that, that, that there was holes and emptiness in my life. And there were things that I was lacking for the simple fact that I wasn't connected for the reason why I was created. And as I matured, God started to show me myself and what he showed me. And I used to have a reoccurring nightmare as I was growing up, up trying to have a life without Jesus Christ. The knowledge of who he was, is, and is to come. I kept having a reoccurring nightmare every time I went to bed. And that nightmare was me falling. I was just falling in darkness, falling in darkness. Every night, excuse me, I would go to bed and I would lay in bed and I would just continue falling. As soon as I fall asleep and I start, it wasn't a dream, it was a nightmare. And it was utter darkness around me and I was just falling and falling and falling. And it wasn't until I repented, I confessed, repented and believed that Jesus Christ is who he was, says he was, and I allowed God to convert me into the heathen I had become into the person he wanted me to be. It wasn't until I allowed that, that process to happen that I stopped falling. Somebody had told me one time, if I hit the bottom, that would have been it. My life would have been over. And sure enough, I went through some situations and circumstances where five people I knew had got murdered within a month apart. Less than a month apart was a couple of them. Five people who I was connected to. And God asked me at one of the, the, the services I was at, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. It's like, what you going to do? What you going to do? You going to live for the reasons that you were created, or you want to try and live in this world that's not, not your home. And I had to make a decision there, and I ran my butt back to church. I'm going to be a live chicken than a dead dog. So I took my butt right back to church and got right back into place. And that started my process of being converted. And, and God was proving me. It says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. I hear the Spirit, Holy Spirit telling me that it's sad, but that the bondage is not so much Egypt anymore, but that the bondage is church and religion. That people has allowed their denomination, people have allowed their pastor, people have allowed their bishop, their apostle, their church affiliation to be bigger than God. That's a sad, sad shame. How it is, you have removed Jesus as the pinnacle, as the center of your joy, and replaced that with religion. That's a sad, that's exactly how the Pharisees scribes, Sadducees, and Zealots. That's exactly how I came to the place where, where they didn't recognize Jesus. They were so full of religion, they didn't even recognize Jesus when Jesus showed up. They had no idea who he was. Talking to him like he was crazy. Snatching the, the scrolls from him when he said, today this scripture is fulfilled into your hearing. 
That's a sad shame where you have put your ministry and, and your church and your church affiliation and your denomination and the fact that you speak in tongues, shout, and got your little favorite seat in your favorite pew ahead of the reason why you've been doing what you're doing. That's why I said, Moses said to people, fear not for God has come to prove you. I hear the Holy Spirit speak. God has come to prove you. Every day you wake up and God and grace is on one side and mercy is on the other side and you see that God is giving you another day. God has come to prove you. He wants you to show him that, that the greater is he that's in you, greater, greater is he that's in you than you that's in this world. Verse 21, and the people stood afar off and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Verse 22 in chapter 20 of Exodus. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thou, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Verse 23, Ye shall not make with me God, gods of silver. <laughs> gods of silver. Oh, I got I to gotta have that car. I'm broke, but I got to have that. I'm, I'm going to go in debt. I'm going to get that car. You have made something that would demand your money, your credit, and your attention. That's what the Holy Spirit, when I heard that, I don't know who God is speaking to, but some people covet and idolize stuff so much that you're willing to go in debt for it. You're willing to work on your Sabbath day for it. That's what I hear the Holy Spirit taking. God is trying to prove you. You should not make with thee gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. See, that's what walking in the Holy Spirit will allow you to do. You will be able to read stuff in the Old Testament and you will have an understanding of why you're in bondage in 2017. Oh, that was back then. No, you're still in bondage to the same demons and devils that was back then. Cancer just had a different name back then. But cancer is a spirit. It's an evil spirit. And I'm going to say this, and I pray I, I step on somebody's uh, Holy Ghost toes. While you busy bringing awareness to the demon, wearing pink clothes and putting pink ribbons on, where in Scripture did you ever see Jesus cast out a demon by bringing awareness to it? He called it out and sent it back where it came from. He ain't never tell you to buy no t-shirts and no stickers and send no donation to, to help support no demon. That's all cancer is. Cancer is a demon straight from hell, period. So is every other sickness. The Bible says no plague shall come nigh our dwelling. No, we don't allow the, the, the We buy t-shirts and bumper stickers and ribbons. Oh, I survived this. You ain't survived nothing. You ain't survived nothing. If it wouldn't have been for Jesus Christ, we all be men most miserable. You ain't survived nothing. It's a sad shame that we so entangled with this world that we can't even see Jesus Christ. We don't even recognize that the blood still is, is, has power. Can you imagine Jesus walking around and people draped in pink shirts? Or oh, we out here jogging for cancer. Or we're out here bringing awareness. What kind of foolishness are we caught up in in this world that we live in? We are in the world. We're not of the world. We ain't supposed to be partaking. I don't, you can't come to an all-night prayer, but you can go out there and do a 5K for the cancer awareness. Susan B. Coleman. I lost y'all's mind. Oh, that ain't nothing wrong with that. You're right. Because that demon sitting there, go oh, run, run, run for me, run for me. Oh, it ain't that deep. It's exactly that deep. When people are dying and going to hell, it's exactly that deep. You should not make... Uh, you should not make with me God, gods of silver. He called them gods. Gods of silver. Verse 23 in chapter 20. Neither shall ye make unto me gods of gold. I only want to get on gold. Because like I said, I was raised in the hip hop era. If you ain't had you no know, gold chain, you wasn't even accepted. A god. Verse 24. The altar of the earth thou shalt not make unto me. He says, don't make me an altar of the earth. In other words, what's that? A monument. These things, these edifices. You have made where you, oh man, we just got our church remodeled. We got a waterfall. We got new carpet. We got new pews. And people going straight to hell from there. That's why y'all have funerals instead of homecomings. An altar of the earth thou shalt not make unto me. Thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings. Thou sheep, thy oxen, in all places where I record my name. I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. And the, it says, and the altar of of, excuse me, let me read it again, 24. And altar of, of earth thou shalt make unto me. We make them unto God. Thanks, Holy Ghost, for correcting that. We make them unto God. We don't make them unto man. That's the point I'm trying to make. And today we know fellowships by a person. We don't know fellowships by the movement of God's spirit. 
Oh, that's his church and that's her church. I remember years ago, I was about to go into a church. I was about to walk right in the doors. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me before I even got to the vestibule. He's like, this ain't my house. <laughs> I heard the Spirit speak. I'm thinking like, who said that? I'm looking for the intercom. He said, this is not my house. And it's a sad shame that we have built these edifices. And we've put men's names on so-and-so ministry and so-and-so ministry and so-and-so ministry. I'm, I'm not saying what God did or did not tell these people to do to do, to do what they're doing. And before you get all, all well, you know, uh, read your Bible. Do what the Bible say do. An altar of the earth thou shalt make unto me, and thou shalt sacrifice their own burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thou sheep, thine oxen, in all places where I record my name. Where he records his name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. That's a promised blessing if you do it right. Verse 25, and if thou will make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it upon a hewn stone. For if thou lift up the tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. He's explaining to you how it is that we're supposed to do things. I want you to study out for yourself if you have the curiosity and the Spirit is leading you to find out what a hewn stone is. For if thou lift up a tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. What is God saying? He's saying, look, I've given you everything you need. I've given you all the ingredients. I've given you all the directions. I've given you all the instructions to acknowledge me. Don't do it your way. Do it my way. Do what I'm telling you to do. Excuse me. Sometimes I wonder why people pay all them thousands, in some cases all them millions for these church buildings <laughs> that they only use once and twice a week. All that money going into a building that you use once or twice a week. And you got people in your very con congregation starving, poor, hungry, broke, busted, and disgusted. But you put all that money into an edifice. All you really need is a hall. You just need some place to assemble and fellowship. You just need some place where y'all can come together because the spirit is within man. The temples are not made in man's. It's not that God's spirit does not live in, in temples uh, made with man's hands. He's in us. Finally, verse 26. <laughs> Excuse me. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto my altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Woo, Lord have mercy. So that's, just, that's what the children of Israel were given on Shavuot, Shavuot, S-H-A-V-U-O-T, what, what they were given. That's the law that some people think has been abolished and that we live by grace. And the Lord was speaking to me as I came to this because I know a lot of preachers who, oh, that's the law, you know, we don't live by that. That's the Old Testament. Let me help you understand something. The law, the Bible says in the Old New Testament, law is a schoolmaster. Think for one second if we didn't have any laws. This is what the Lord was sharing with me before I came on here, is that in the civil rights time, what they were fighting for was for the government that we're under currently to respect their own laws. Respect the laws that you have made and allow us to have the rights equal to everybody else. The, the, good morning, Harriet. That's what the, the civil rights thing was all about. We want to be treated equal. We want to sit where we want to sit on the bus. We want to be able to eat and drink where we, where we want to eat and drink. You know, you're taking taxes, you're taking money from us. So we want to be able to enjoy the things that you've given us. So if we didn't have any laws, if the children of Israel what was not, were never given any laws, guess what? They wouldn't be free. We wasn't free because the laws was written as a people, and we're still not free in America. We wasn't free because they were written in the books, the, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and all these different things. That, that's, that's not what freed us. What freed us is the, the, the enforcement of the laws. The laws were there, but they weren't being enforced, and they're still not, because we still people getting murdered and killed in the street and no one going to jail for it. When the Bible clearly said, thou shalt not kill, it didn't say because you're a police officer or because you're black or because you're white. It doesn't say that. It says, thou shalt not kill. So even though they may seem like they're getting away with it here, they will not get away with it when they stand before a righteous God. We have another set of scriptures that I want to read into your hearing, which come from the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles in the second chapter before we close out. And we're still talking about what you're waiting for. Because what I want to always do when we deal with um, 
the feasts and the festivals, is I want to read the foreshadow. The foreshadow is found in the Old Testament. What's the foreshadow? I just spoke on the foreshadow on the Sabbath. The foreshadow is the things that God fulfilled uh, in the Old Testament to show prophetically what he would fulfill through Jesus Christ. All the spring feasts, the Passover, kind of the Omer, and Pentecost is what Jesus Christ fulfilled. He just spoke it, and then he did it. And that, that's how you know he is who he is. That's why we say was, is, and is to come. So many people know the is, is to come because they read that in the New Testament, but for some reason they forsake the Old Testament without the understanding. What the Bible clearly says, with all thy get, get an understanding. You don't even know why it is things that are where they are because you don't understand the foreshadow. You need to understand the foreshadow to understand who Jesus Christ was. He was the spring feast. He fulfilled the spring feast. The one thing that has not been fulfilled yet is Sukkot or Tabernacles because that's when the church will be raptured up or when we he will tabernacle with us for eternity. There are things that, that's in the, the scriptures. No, they all can be found in Leviticus 23. Let's get into Acts Chapter 2, I want to stay on point. We're talking about what you're waiting for. And I want you to understand as we go through these scriptures to understand in your life there are things that you can be freed from and be delivered from and walk into another level of glory. That's what I hear the Spirit of the Holy, Holy Spirit speaking in particular this, this Pentecost is that we, we, we who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be walking in another level of glory before this season is out. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now I want you to understand the foreshadow. In the foreshadow, the children of Israel was what? They was all with one accord in one place. They were all, they were all at the Mount Sinai uh, waiting on Moses to bring the laws. So I want you to put these in context with one another. This is what you have to learn how to do when studying your Bible, is how the Bible connects. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So you got to know when to, how to divide the word and put it together to understand the fullness of what Jesus Christ is saying. You don't have to be a Jew because the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever he has spoken to us, whatsoever he has said. This is the word of God. He will, he will help you understand the things you don't understand. Not, not necessarily the preacher, the teacher, because you know not all of them don't understand themselves. Acts Chapter 2 says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, just like the children of Israel Mount Sinai. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Now, ain't that the same thing that happened that we just read before they was given the Ten Commandments? They heard a sound from heaven. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind. It filled the house where they were sitting. And the same thing happened. The Bible says that it, it, it filled up. The cloud filled up. But they wasn't supposed to touch it. Verse 3, and there, put them, there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. See, now, the, the difference between this time and that time is they wasn't supposed to touch it. They wasn't supposed to touch it. But now, in this different dispensation, not only can you touch it, but it's about to overtake you. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. That's why in this day and time, and this is, no one's going to be without an excuse. You either receive the word or you reject the word. You know, it was a little thing people used to say back in the day, well, I don't receive that. I don't receive that. And God has always used me since he, he's called me to be like a sergeant of arms in the body of Christ. I tell people stuff they don't want to hear that they need to hear. I've always been used for that. That ain't no big deal to me. When you love people, you tell them the truth, regardless of how they're going to receive it. When you love people, that's what you do. So God has always used me for that. So I've always been a bearer of good, bad news. It's good news, but it's bad news for that demon that got you bound. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat on each of them. Verse 4, here we go. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and begun to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <clears throat> they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So what you waiting for? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Because when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, there ain't no way in these, this world we're living in you allow yourself to be bound. There ain't no way. There ain't no way. Sometimes I'll be somewhere minding my own business, just innocent as can be, just going along my day, and, and the Holy Spirit will, will quicken me like, hey, 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 hold on. Hold on. There's something going on here that ain't right. I'm thinking I'm just going somewhere to chill or to relax or do something in innocence. Matter of fact, yesterday was a day like that. I went somewhere yesterday 
And then my Holy Ghost alarm went off. And it's like, Lord was like, I don't want you to have nothing to do with this. Here I was thinking I was about to do something that was simple and, and, and uh, appeared innocent and fun. And the Holy Spirit quickened me. I was like, no, no, no. I don't want you. No, I don't want you a part of this. I don't want you to have nothing to do with this. Get away from this. And so that's what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit because you hear people say all the time, I got the Holy Ghost, but does the Holy Ghost have you? You don't tell the Holy Ghost what to do. The Holy Ghost tells you what to do. That's the difference between a person who, who, who fears God and a person who don't. Conviction will always be there to correct you and to keep you from hurt, harm, or danger so that you can receive the promises of God. Verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues like the Spirit gave them others. Verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, I just spoke on the Sabbath concerning Jews and Gentiles because the Bible says there is neither Jew. They were, well, that's for the Jews. No, it's not. Because they were first called Christians at Antioch. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Who was these men that was called Christians? They were Jews. So if they called Jews Christians, who are you? We are children of the Most High God. See, the devil wants to divide us because he knows that we cannot stand divided according to the scripture. Every king that's divided against itself cannot stand. So we have to stand on the word of the living God. I, I realized a long time ago, and I thank God for this realization because I'd probably be dead right now. I am not a black man. That's not who I am. That's not who, what my soul is. That's not who I am. As a, I, I refuse. People's like, well, what, what do you do when they call you a nigga? My name ain't nigga. My mom named me Sean Henry Scott Sr. Well, not senior. I put the senior on. But my name is Sean Henry Scott. So when they, hey, nigga boy, who are you talking to? He ain't talking to me. <laughs> my name is Sean. So I never got caught up on all that nonsense. You know, people have died before their time because they've been fighting the wrong battles. And that was almost me. Growing up as a teen, I said, I'm going to be a black panther. I'm going to go out and fight. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. God said, you're going to die before your time. I did not call you for that. Who among us that are living chose their color of skin upon coming out of the womb, out of the matrix? That's what the womb is. The words in the Bible It's called matrix. When you came out your mother's womb, did you choose to be black or white? Or was that chosen for you? <laughs> what I look, excuse me, what I look like telling God that he made a mistake by making me black. I'm not going to explain my blackness to nobody because I didn't have nothing to do with it. You want to know why I'm black? Well, you ask God. And my Bible says, touch not his anointed and do his prophets no harm. So before I go out here and do a civil rights march about me being black and that black matters, I'm going to stand on the word of the living God and, 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 and call down angels who God has given me charge. See, we, we don't fight fleshly fights. We fight spiritual battles. And when we don't understand the things that we're supposed to do, we'll get caught up in this world. That's what the Bible does. It liberates you and, and, and it helps you understand who you are in this world. Why do you think that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego was able to go into the fiery furnace and not even come out smelling like smoke? Why do you think that? Why do you think that, that, that because of the, what they did, the, the Bible says, I see four men in and one like the son. How did that man know what the son of God looked like? Because Jesus had not manifested himself in the flesh yet. How did he know that? Because he is the um, Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The Bible makes it clear, if you, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a lust of the flesh to want to fight these worldly battles and these things. That's flesh. That's all that is. I want to fight. I got to fight. I ain't got to fight nothing. The burden of proof is on the devil to prove that we ain't who Jesus Christ is. He already done it. So what you waiting for? Let me finish reading before I get into it. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noise abroad, the Martha came together, and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in their own language. Now what's their own language? You got to go back to the Tower of Babel before God, when, when, when he separated them. That's how you know all. Oh, now i got to read these scriptures. Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? Hold on, they Galileans. Why are they all speaking in their own native tongue? Verse 8. And how we hear every man in their own tongue wherein they were born. So he, they're hearing them in the tongue in which they was born. Parthenians, Mendes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Capper, Cappadocia, and Pontus in Asia. Verse 10, Philegra, Pompilia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya, and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. 
Verse 11, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them speak in tongues the, the wonderful works of God. So they were speaking in their own native tongue the wonderful works of God. They were speaking and proclaiming the things that God had done. Now, I don't know who it was that was hearing all this, but they actually understand all these different tongues because they just broke it down what all these men were speaking and what they were saying. Verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaning this? Verse 13 in Acts chapter 2, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. 14, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said to them, ye men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you. And hearken to my words, 15, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. That's why it's important for you to know the word, because when things come to pass, you can connect them to when they happen in scriptures. But when you do not understand what he has said by way of the Holy Spirit, you're just going to think people are drunk and they're crazy. Like, why are they doing that? With no understanding. 17. And it came to pass that in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Excuse me. And your son and your daughter shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall, shall dream dreams. 18. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now, correct me if I am wrong, but isn't that the exact same thing that happened at Mount Sinai when they was waiting on Moses to come down with the commandments? That's why the word confirms itself. That's why the Old Testament is a foreshadow of things to happen and be fulfilled in a new covenant. Verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord of the Lord come. 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ask the thief on the cross, the malefactor on the cross. He recognized that Jesus was Jesus. The other one said, uh, if he was Jesus, why won't he get us down from here and get us out of here? So what you waiting on? Verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. Once again, it's the foreshadow of what happened before. God explained to the children of Israel when he spoke to them out of heaven, I am the Lord your God, who delivered you out of Egypt, the land of bondage, on eagles' wings. He'll, he's reaffirming to them and reassuring them and helping them understand. And that's what we...